Good morning. It's good to see you this morning as we celebrate together, as we celebrate this Memorial Day weekend, in appreciation of all of those who have sacrificed for the freedoms that we have. We are grateful for that. And as we look at God's Word, we're encouraged at Christ's sacrifice for us. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you, as we recognize the incredible sacrifice that you gave in giving your life on the cross for us, Lord, as Father, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ. We are grateful for that. As we look at your word this morning, may we be encouraged in the hope and the grace that we have in you. May we be challenged in the responsibility that we have in responding to you and serving you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I uh, was going to seminary, I uh, was in Minnesota and Minneapolis, and I played in a softball league. And uh, so one evening, I had the opportunity to take a young lady to the softball game that I was playing in. And uh, my goal in that game uh, was to impress her with my athletic ability. So I, I took her to the game, and uh, she knew quite a few of the people. It was a church league, and she knew quite a few people from our church that were there. And even though she didn't, uh, she lived about 70 miles away. But uh, so anyway, so she knew a lot of the people. So we went to the game, and, and I was really fired up. This was going to be a good game, and, and we won quite handily. And for those of you who are into sports, I was five for five at the plate. And I made, uh, <clears throat> say so myself, a couple dazzling plays in the field also. And uh, so I was really ready when I talked to her after the game to, uh, to hear all of the praises that she was going to uh, share about my abilities. So I, I went there to where she was and... Uh, First thing she said, well, how'd you do? <laughs> How did I do? She was not necessarily watching the game. She was busy just chatting with all the people up in the stands. So my goal to impress her with my great abilities failed miserably. Now, that was about 35 years ago, and... Uh, here in less than a week, I and that young lady are going to be celebrating our 33rd wedding anniversary. So fortunately, <laughs> she, uh, she may not have been impressed with my athletic ability, but in a weak moment, she agreed to marry me. <laughs> but we try to impress people, don't we? We've all done it. We've all tried to impress people. It might be a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or maybe a potential boyfriend or girlfriend that we're trying to impress. Maybe it's impressing the in crowd that we want to be in. Maybe it's a boss, someone that we believe is important or powerful, and, and our goal is to impress them. We've all tried to impress people. In Luke 12, Jesus challenges us about our attitudes. He challenges us about the danger of hypocrisy. He warns us of our thoughts of fearing man rather than fearing God. Our thoughts that are focused on what other people think rather than what pleases God. Last week, Jezer shared and he talked about some signs signs that we need to be aware of. And in the verses immediately following that, Jesus challenges or warns the Pharisees and other religious leaders about their lives and about hypocrisy. And that leads us to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, the crowd is gathering, and it begins with the words, mean, or in the meantime, 
But so we don't know the exact distance or time frame between when Jesus gives that warning to the Pharisees and the words here in chapter 12, but they were probably very, very close together. In fact, it could be immediately following. And so we see that, that Jesus warns about the danger of hypocrisy. Notice what it says in the first three verses of Luke chapter 12. It says, in the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear in inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. What are the circumstances of what's taking place here in Luke chapter 12? Well, we see that the setting was hostile. The religious leaders were plotting on how to get rid of Jesus. They were attempting to trap him with questions that they gave. And, and this fight was becoming more and more intense between the religious leaders and Jesus. We also see that the time was short. Jesus realized that soon he would be crucified, and time was of the essence. The crowd was large. The crowds had been growing as people clamored to see Jesus' miracles and message. As we've been watching and, and reading through these last few chapters of the book of Luke, we see that, that the crowds were getting larger and larger. People were intrigued by his message. What was he going to say? They were also excited about the miracles that would he would perform, what new things were going to take place. And so they were, the crowds were growing, but now there was another aspect which caused the crowds to grow even larger. This confrontation between Jesus and the religious leaders, what was going to take place next? Remember being on the school playground, what drew a crowd? You heard the words, fight, fight, and everybody joined, not to fight, but to watch. And that's part of what was happening here. These people were, were wondering, what's going to happen between Jesus and the religious leaders? And so the, the crowd was so large, it says that people were trampling on one another. And so in all of this chaos, Jesus recognized the fourth thing and that his message was vital. His followers needed to hear the message that he was giving. And this created an urgency, both the, the shortness of time and the importance of the message. And while there were gigantic crowds, some were his opponents, some were just interested bystanders, he focuses his message here in these verse, first, or first verses of chapter 12 to his followers, his disciples and others who were following him. And we see he talks about leaven. We're familiar with the term yeast, leaven or yeast. And throughout Scripture, leaven refers to or pictures sin. And it points to something that gradually grows once it is introduced. You're familiar with that, with bread and other things where you put yeast in, it begins to rise and it infiltrates all of the dough. And it causes it to spread. And Jesus warned them of the leaven of the Pharisees, which was hypocrisy. How many of you are familiar with friendship bread? You can raise your hand if you're familiar with friendship bread. All right, so anybody here have friendship bread in your freezer? Okay, huh, you have something to do this weekend. All right, so, but what happens with friendship bread, and it's connected with the Amish, but actually in, in doing a little background of it, most people believe that it was connected with several hundred years ago, or a few hundred years ago, the, the Germans, and they had a Hermann or Hermann, or I can't know exactly how to pronounce it, cake, which was the same type of a thing, and now they have this friendship bread, and it became really popular about 1990 as it, it spread around the internet, but it was long before that that Friendship Bread was around. 
And what happens is you make this bread, and it has very simple ingredients, but it includes yeast, and, and you make it, and then you divide it up into parts, and you keep part, but then you're supposed to give some parts to other people. And you're supposed to spread it around. And you can keep it in your refrigerator. It takes a, a period of several days, I think up to 10 days to actually do it. But, but you can store it there, or you can store it in your freezer for obviously much longer periods of time. And they say that this friendship bread is, is even passed from generation to generation in families. And, and what, one of the th ways that it became very popular is people would go on a trip, and as they would have friends, they would meet, they would share it with them. They were sharing it, but the key was that yeast that would just continue to to infiltrate and cause those different portions of the bread and as you made it and then made more and more it would continue to expand and that's sort of what this was in a very negative way the leaven of the Pharisees and Jesus warned against this permeating influence of the Pharisees what they did was spreading around this permeating influence. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33 says, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. And when Jesus used the example of leaven, the people there understood it. For their Passover, they would, there were several things they did in preparation for Passover. One of the things they did in preparation for their Passover celebration was they would meticulously clean their house because they wanted to make sure they got all of the leaven out of the house. And so even if it was like little dusts of it in the floor, I mean, they would, they would meticulously sweep and clean everything. And if you understand the Passover, it goes back to the Old Testament story of the Jews as they went out of Egypt, they, that Passover, and when that death angel passed over their house, and then they left immediately, and, and part of the celebration was the unleavened bread. And so as they we had that picture as their Passover celebration each year, they would clean out all of the leaven. And Jesus was warning his followers about the leaven, the sin, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and others. And so what is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy it originally was, was given to describe those who were in plays, actors, as they would play a part they would wear a mask and they, and they played the role of a character in the play. As we think of, of hypocrisy just in a simple practical definition, it could be considered saying one thing but doing another. A hypocrite is a person who does not do what they say. Hypocrisy also involves trying to impress others to hide our true character. The Pharisees were busy attempting to impress the people, but were covering up their truly ungodly character inside themselves. Jesus used a description of this of what they called whitewashed tombs. And, and if you'll read one of, the, one of the conversations, debates between Jesus and the religious leaders, one of many, he called them you whitewashed tombs. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, for a Jew, they could not touch anything that was dead. That would make them unclean. And so they did not want to accidentally step on a tomb of a dead person because then they would be ceremonially unclean. So they would take the, the, the graves, the tombs, and they would whitewash them so people knew that's where dead bones were, and so they would avoid it. And so when Jesus compared the Pharisees, the religious leaders, to whitewashed tombs, the idea of, yeah, they're all cleaned up on the outside, but on the inside they have that same dead body. And so we see the importance of not being a hypocrite. When we're hypocritical, we focus on reputation. We focus on our attempt to impress others. But God wants us to focus on our character, who we are before God. 
John Maxwell shares a definition of success which points to the importance of avoiding hypocrisy and and focusing on character. What does it mean to be a success in life? And, And he gives this definition. He says this, success is when is that people that know me the best love and respect me the most. That may take a second to think through that. The people that really know me respect me most. You see, it, it's easy to fool someone who doesn't know me very well. But it's much more difficult to fool someone who knows me very well. Abraham Lincoln reminds us that our hypocrisy may be exposed, but he says this, he says, you can fool all the people some of the time and some of the people all of the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. I'd like to change that a little bit. He was a pretty wise man, but I'd like to change that You can fool some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time, but you can't fool God. And so Jesus went on there in verses 2 and 3 that we read that said those things that we do in the dark will be exposed to the light. The things that we say in secret will be announced from the housetop. Our true character will be exposed no matter how much we try to hide it, no matter how much we try to impress people. God knows who we truly are. He understands our actions and he also understands the attitudes beyond or behind those actions. You know, we often attempt to hide our words, our thoughts, or our actions, but God knows everything that we think, say, and do. I know I've had the chance a couple times to go on a tour of the U.S. Capitol, and maybe you have, the Capitol building, maybe you have also. But one of the things that they do on those tours is they take you to the whispering spot. Are you familiar with that? It's a spot in, uh, in a place they call Statutory Hall. But at one time, it was where the House of Representatives met, and in the 1800s, I believe it was John Quincy Adams. I think that was the one. He was, he was on one side. His desk was in a certain spot there where they were meeting at, in the house chamber of that time. And where he sat with the dome of the room, the acoustics made it so somebody could be whispering on the opposite side and you could hear it clearly even though you were a good distance away from them. So if you've gone on the tour, they'll have you stand in this one area, and and the tour guide will walk over to the other side and whisper something, and you could hear them just like they're talking out loud to you. And as legend goes, John Adams would, would be sitting there at his desk that happened to be in the right spot, and he'd be pretending to be asleep while listening to the secrets and strategies of his enemies from the other side of the room. What they thought was done in secret was shouted from the housetops, in a sense. And according to the story, he knew their plans and their strategies and could prepare for them. But God knows so much more. And so Jesus is telling the disciples, his followers, he's saying, listen, don't be a hypocrite. Don't fall into the trap that these Pharisees are are leading you into of, of spending your life impressing others rather than pleasing God. You see, because hypocrisy is caused by the fear of man, what will other people think? I want to impress them whether it's true about me or not. I want them to make, or I want to make them think this of me even if it's not true. And so we see that hypocrisy being caused by the fear of man, we're more concerned about what other people think than what God thinks. 
And so then Jesus said, don't get caught up in the trap of hypocrisy, but rather fear God, not man. Verses four through seven says, and I say to you, Jesus still speaking, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after and that have no more that they can do, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he is killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Now in those four verses, the words fear or afraid are used five times. And Jesus reminds us of whom we should fear. Don't fear people, instead, fear God. Our goal in life should not be to impress others, but it should be to honor God. As we celebrate Memorial Day and and a reminder of so many people who have sacrificed, many even sacrificing their lives for the freedoms we have, there's so many heroic stories. One took place in the Battle of Okinawa in World War II. A man named Desmond Doss. And actually, a lot has been written about him, even to the point where a movie was made about his story called Hacksaw Ridge. And if you're familiar with Doss's story, he was a pacifist, and and many people around him would mock him. They considered him a sissy, you know, afraid, all these different terms that I'm sure that they used. But while he wouldn't bear arms, he still ended up in the military, and he was there in Okinawa. And when they were there, they had this incredibly bloody battle. Many, many soldiers killed and wounded. And if you're familiar with the story, that night he saved 75 people. He would sneak up over this ridge to get these people and and bring them back down to safety in the safety of the troops and to where they could get medical attention and he risked his life over and over and over and over again. What was he concerned about? Was he concerned about what other people thought? No, one of the the incredible characteristics of his life was his strong faith. He wanted to please God and help others rather than simply impress people. And he would step out and do things that when you look at, you would say, that's crazy, but he did it because he desired to honor God in the way that he lived and help others with the life that he was given. And here we see Jesus pointed out that anything man can do to us is only temporal. You know, you read verse 4 and says, don't worry about the person that can only kill you. (laughs) You're like, "Uh, that's pretty big. Instead, worry about the one who is the eternal judge. This past week on the island of Haiti, There were three people that were killed, missionaries, a young couple and another person involved in that mission agency that were killed by gangs there in Haiti. The young couple, Davy and Natalie Lloyd, they were in their early 20s. They'd been there for about two years. Davy's parents had been involved, and I believe they even began that project with their mission agency. It involved an orphanage and other outreaches there in Haiti. But you may have read or heard on the news that incredibly sad story of how they were killed this week. But I was able to come across a quote from Davy Lloyd's journal that was shared. And now, People would listen or hear their story and say, how sad, they're in their early 20s, they'd been married for about two years or even a little less, it was 2022 that they were married, I don't know what time of the year, but somewhere right around two years that they'd been married. What a waste. Had so much they could do, but yet, some people would say, even why? 
Now we're sitting here, we understand why, because they wanted to represent Jesus Christ. But listen to what Davy had written in a, in a journal entry. He said this, he said, I want to live intentionally in light of eternity. What a powerful statement. You see, he got Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. Don't worry about the people that can just kill your body. Worry about the one who controls eternity. And that's what they were focused on. Pleasing the one who is in control of it all. Reminds me of the quote, and you have a good chance you're familiar with this quote of Jim Elliott, who was one of five that was killed by the Aka Indians attempting to, to bring the gospel to that tribe of Indians in South America. And uh, they were all killed, all five of them. But Jim Elliott, before he died, had written this, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So Jesus is telling his followers, he's saying, listen, I know there's going to be some hard times, but consider what is most important and recognize that these temporal things, these things that take place in our life are minuscule in comparison to eternity. But he didn't want to leave it just in the negative, talking about that God is the judge, but he also wanted to remind them of God's love and mercy. And he goes on in verses 6 and 7, says, you know, do what affects that person or God who is the judge for eternity. And then in verses 6 and 7, he talks about the sparrow. And he reminds us that we can trust God because he cares for us. So why this comparison of a sparrow? It says that five sparrows could be purchased for two pennies or two copper coins, which about one-sixteenth of an unskilled laborer's daily wage. And so these sparrows were considered of very, very little value. But yet God knows when one falls. God knows when that sparrow dies. How much more does he care about you and know what's going on in your life? We need to recognize that God is the judge, but we also need to recognize that God is a God of grace and love and he desires restored relationship with us. And so God cares about us. He cares about the sparrow, how much more he cares about us. And he knows everything about us. He even knows how many hairs we have. We know that I may be lost four or five this morning. He knows. And he cares. And so we see that we can trust him. And then he concludes the lesson with a challenge to confess Christ. It actually goes through verse 12, but we're first going to look at verses 8 through 10. It says, Also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man will also confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. That word confess means to say the same. I'm going to stand with Christ. Now, oftentimes we hear people say, well, you know, my faith is private. And that sounds okay. It, it almost sounds spiritual. But I think we need to be careful the words that we use and the true meaning of the words. My faith is private. I would like to and I think it's important, I should say, I would like, it's so important, it's vital that we change that. My faith may be personal. It's between me and God. But God does not want my faith to be private. Notice what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1.16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek Yes, our faith is personal. It's a relationship between me and my Savior, between God and myself. But it's not to be private. We're to proclaim Christ to the world in our actions and our words. You see, we honor God in our actions, and that helps us to avoid hypocrisy. 
but we also share our faith in our words as his witnesses. And yes, confessing Christ brings the risk of rejection and hostility from men, but it brings reward from God. And then we look at verse 10. And verse 10 is probably one of the most misunderstood and misapplied verses in Scripture. And it talks about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. What, it, what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Verse 10 says, and we read it just a minute ago, but I'll share it again. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. And again, Son of Man was a title that Jesus used of himself, so it's speaking of Jesus. So if we speak a word against Jesus, it'll be forgiven. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. So what does that mean, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Some people say, well, it's to deny Christ when placed under pressure. You know, I'm a Christ follower, but, but someone challenges me or even threatens me. And I said, well, no, no. Is that what it, that specific phrase means? Well, let's look at an example that's going to take place not too far in the future from our words here in Luke chapter 12. Short time after this, Jesus is going to be arrested. The disciples are going to flee. But one of the disciples, Peter, sort of hangs out on the edges. And while Jesus is on trial... Peter's outside warming himself around a fire, and, and you remember the story. Three different times, people say, weren't you with him? Aren't you one of his followers? And what did, you, and Pete, what did Peter do each of the three times? He denied vehemently. I don't even know the man. And it says the last time he even cursed saying, I have nothing to do with him. He denied his Lord. In that Passover meal, we celebrated uh, communion or the Lord's Supper, which was first instituted there in that Passover that had taken place shortly before Peter's denial. But during that time, Jesus said, you're going to deny me. But we look at Peter's life. Yes, what a sad situation there. But yet we see later on, Peter is willing to stand for the faith no matter the persecution, and he's eventually martyred for following Christ. So it's not speaking of that, even though we don't want to deny Jesus. But blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is to reject the testimony that Jesus is Lord. Notice what it says in John 15, 26. It says, but when the Helper, and that's a title for the Holy Spirit, but when the Helper, or Holy Spirit, comes, whom I shall send, Jesus is speaking, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. One of the responsibilities of the Holy Spirit is to bear witness or to testify of who Jesus Christ is. The foundation for our salvation is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that perfect sacrifice for our sins. And the Holy Spirit bears witness of that. So we blaspheme the Holy Spirit when we reject that testimony. We reject ultimately Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for our sins, the conviction and prompting of the Holy Spirit to put our faith and trust in Christ. John 3.36 says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's the consequence of rejecting the Holy Spirit. We're saying, God, I don't want or need you. And I'm rejecting that testimony, that prompting of the Holy Spirit to put my faith in Jesus Christ. A couple weeks ago, we had a, a lady who called the church, and, and she was very concerned that she had blasphemed the Holy Spirit. So as, as we talked on the phone for a while, there were some really hard things she was going through. But I was able to encourage her in this. 
Her concern about blaspheming the Holy Spirit pointed to the fact that she had not blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Now, there were some things that she needed to work on, and we prayed for her to have strength and, and guidance to follow Christ, to obey Him. But she hadn't blasphemed the Holy Spirit. She cared, and although she was struggling, she had a concern about a right relationship with God. And then we see the last two verses here in Luke 12, verse, the, uh, the, this passage. It says, now when they bring you to the synagogues, verses 11 and 12, when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, but do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Now, what is that not saying? That's not saying if you teach, if you speak a message or teach a class, you don't have to prepare because God's just going to tell you what to say. That's not what it's saying. It says that we need to be prepared to defend our faith. We need to study God's Word. We, we need to take the importance of sharing God's Word. Is we need to take it very seriously. Some of you say, well, maybe you used that this morning, John. It seems like you're just sort of shooting from the hip. Now, I actually did prepare. And... Uh, but what's it saying? It's saying when we are being challenged, when we are being persecuted, we can be confident that God is with us and He will guide us. There's, a, there's many examples in Scripture. But we can recognize that when we're persecuted, God will be our defense and God will give us the words to say. I'd like to share just a, two, two examples of many. In Acts chapter 4, the apostle Peter stood before the Sanhedrin. Peter and John had, were being arrested. They were going to be thrown in prison and facing a lot of persecution and adversity. And notice how Peter's response begins. It says, and Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. And then it shares his response to the Sanhedrin, to these judges, these religious leaders. In Acts chapter 13, Paul was on a missionary journey with Barnabas, and he was challenged by a sorcerer named Elymas. And Elymas and others had been causing the town to be stirred up and to oppose Paul and Barnabas and to oppose their message. And you'll never guess how Paul's response started. And Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter and Paul could trust that God would walk with them and, and give them wisdom and guidance as they faced those difficult times. And Jesus wanted to remind his followers, and he knew that soon he would not be with them. In a short period of time, he was going to be arrested and then crucified and rise again, and then eventually, 40 days later, go up to heaven. But he wanted to remind them of his faithfulness, that they could trust in him. And so we see this message for, for his followers. Don't be a hypocrite. Strive to live out what you say, what you believe. Why, why don't we need to worry about impressing others and the tendency to hypocrisy? Because our goal is to fear God, not man, to please him. And that involves confessing him before others, but also the confidence in knowing that he will walk through the darkest times with you. And many of those people that were in that crowd would be thrown in prison or even killed for their faith. But they could trust in a faithful God who would walk with them and stand with them. And so they had their hope in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness, for your love, and thank you for the hope we have in Christ for our salvation and also for our daily lives. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to, to live our lives not to impress others, but to please you. Lord, help us to be willing to confess you in the way we live, but also in the words we say. And recognize in those difficult times that you are with us and that you will guide and direct us. We are grateful and thankful in Jesus' name. Amen.